We were in the second chapter. We came down through where Paul says in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, not yet not I, but Christ liveth in me in the life that I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me, gave himself for me. You know what Paul was literally saying is for me to live, he said I died to myself. That is, I died to my own desires, my own will, my own way. That's a mouthful, isn't it? And for me to live today, because I've died to the old way I lived, is for Jesus Christ to reproduce his life in me and through me. Boy, wouldn't that be great if we could all say that from the bottom of our soul? That's a good goal to shoot at, isn't it? The old apostle said, emulate me, and not uh, to paraphrase, he said, emulate me as I emulate or am a copy of Jesus Christ. You, it's all right to go along with me. And that's what, it, that's what we ought to do here. Crucified with Christ. The old things passed away. All things become new. And he's telling the Galatians this, who have fallen into this era of sliding from grace to works. And boy, it's a, there's a slippery little slide right there. That so many people make the translation. They start off in the grace. They start off in the spirit. And they end up in the flesh. And in striving and working. Trying to impress God. Trying to impress other people. Trying to be religious. Trying to do all these things. Instead of going back to the basis. Which is letting Jesus live in us. You and I will never be holy. Until we begin to go back to the basics. Of where we got our salvation in the first place. It's only, you know, people's hearts are made to shudder at the thought of hellfire. But hellfire does not win people to Jesus. Did you know that? You say, oh, wait a minute, hellfire preaching helps. Yeah, it does. But it doesn't win people. It scares people so they'll start looking for help, help, help. And so it's very valuable. Judgment preaching, hellfire preaching, you bet. Good, profitable. I might just thunder out or rip and snort of myself one of these days. But, the, you know how you get saved? Not the fear of hell. The fear of hell makes you look to see if there's any help. And just as you're ready to turn and run away from hell, you bump right into Jesus. He said, here I am. You see, the only, the only way to get out of the judgment path that we're on is Jesus. And he's close, so close. But we never realize it until we turn in desperation from ourselves and from what we're into and began to look for him. And we find out he's been looking for us all the time. He was always there. We just didn't recognize him. What a blessing that is. Now he said, I don't frustrate the grace of God. If righteousness came by the law, then Christ died in vain. If you could get righteous by keeping little rules and regulations, he said, Jesus Christ did the most foolish thing on earth when he came and died. There's no way you and I can get righteous by the law. Did you know that? The God law is a guideline to tell us how far we are off. The law won't move you back closer. Did you know that? When you, see the, when you see the rule stick out here, the law, it says, boy, you're way, way off. And you look at it and say, oh, I believe it. Oh, this is terrible. I believe the law. You can even get on the law and sit on it. It won't move you toward God. But the law helps you to know where the problem is. And then what do you do? How do you move? To get in line with God. How do you move toward holiness? You go back to God and say, Lord, I can't make it. I'm way out of line. He says, I thought you'd never ask. You see, the law was given for a mirror for we could see ourselves that we are needy creatures and then he can move us by his grace to be what he wants us to be. He said, oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Who cast a witchcraft spell over you is what he's saying. You see, false doctrine is really witchcraft. Unsound doctrine is witchcraft. And he said, O foolish Galatians, who has cast a spell on you that you should not obey the truth before whose eyes Jesus Christ has evidently been set forth, crucified among you? He said, who has thrown a spell on you? You've come under witchcraft control. By believing false doctrine. He said, I just want to ask you one thing. This only would I learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or the hearing of faith? 
Now remember, Paul had laid the foundations of this church. He knew what the foundations were. He had preached those foundation truths of grace. And he had preached and he had seen these people receive the Lord. He had seen them ask Jesus in their hearts and repent of their sins and, and receive the Lord. And he had seen the operation, the evidence that the Holy Spirit had then baptized them into the body of Christ, made them one with Jesus. He'd seen another thing. He'd seen another wonderful thing happen, that Jesus turned and baptized them in the Holy Spirit. And they began to speak with other tongues and to move in power. Now remember, these people are not weak, wobbly people. These, this is a strong, sturdy church, but it had been invaded by termites. And they were boring from within. And termites do their most deadly work when you don't know they're working. While you're sleeping in your house at night, you have no idea they're eating away the foundation. And while they slept, happy in their, their, their grace and wonderful love, false teachers slipped in and began to cast a spell over them. We have a new doctrine, a glorious new truth that you don't have. It always looks good. That's why Christians are in... That's why Christians are hooked on it. What they didn't notice was it didn't match up with what they had been taught. Remember earlier, Paul says, or is it, uh, the, I believe it's earlier, he said, if I are an angel, come and preach to you some other gospel than the one you receive, let him be accursed. That's strong words. That's how sure he was of the foundations the Galatian church was on. And he said, I want to ask you one thing. You Galatians who are spinning around in this thing, you're so busy now, you got your little checklist out. Let's see. I don't do this, therefore I'm holy. I do do this, therefore I'm holy. I don't do this, so I'm holy. And you got your do's and your don'ts, and your do's and your don'ts, and your do's and your don'ts. You can't have, you know, you don't have time for all the checklists, plus concentrate on hearing from the Father. And you get legalistic. And pretty soon, if you get your check, you know, if you go down the checklist far enough, <clears throat> I'm doing pretty well. Of course, I'm humble. Too bad about those other people. I need to pray for them. They're not upon my level. Bless their hearts. And then, of course, if you try to share your glorious righteousness with them and they say well wait a minute we're walking a grace route how dare you here I'm holy trying to give you all this righteousness and you're rejecting it they get angry you see the Galatian heresy always brings with it pride Phariseeism the ability to look down your nose at everybody else because you're spiritual and nobody else is let me tell you something, people. Every single one of us is vulnerable to this thing. That Galatian church was on rock bottom. I mean, she was based on bedrock. And that devil, the devil was so subtle, he sent in religious teaching spirits, and he threw a net over them, and they didn't even know they were hooked. They got busy. Oh, they started working. They got to checking out to be sure they are keeping every little jot and tittle of the law. They put themselves under bondage. After Jesus had set them free, they went back into bondage. You see, the devil can't put you in bondage. He has to lure you to come back and say, would you please put the handcuffs on me? Would you please put the manacles on my foot? Would you let me be in jail again, please? Jesus set me free, but I understand that in order to prove something or other, I'm supposed to go back and get in the cage again. No, no, no. And he has to talk us into that. And none of us are smart enough, are strong enough, not to occasionally be affected by this. After you've been through it a few times, you've been through a few trips to the cage, you get towards say, uh-uh, it took me a long time to get out of that thing last time I messed around with it. No way, I'm not getting in there. No, 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 no. There's a better way. God's got better things for us than that. But he says, did you receive the Spirit by the works of law? Did you work out a checklist so you get where God could hit you with the Spirit? You hear a lot of people going to run around and say, 
Uh, you got the spirit? I hear, I hear people a lot of times talking in charismatic circles. It's real bad. You know, they come in and say, uh, she hadn't got the spirit. Friend, if you have not the spirit of God, you're none of his. You're, you're, you're talking in, you're talking in, in impossibilities. When you get saved, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, the Father, all are operating in conjunction. The Holy Spirit takes us and baptizes us into the body of Christ. He makes you one with Jesus. You say, I didn't know that. I didn't either. It happened to me many years ago. And it was years later that I found out what happened. Of course, I enjoyed it better after I heard about, you know, how, what it was that Jesus did. But I didn't know that the Holy Spirit did that. He didn't stop and say, now, Worley, would you like to be baptized in the Holy Spirit? He just did it because that was essential. That put me into the body of Christ. Now then I heard about another experience whereby the Holy Spirit or Jesus would take you and baptize you in the Holy Spirit. So I went to a lot of meetings looking from people that talked about this. And I thought, well, if there's more, I know I'm saved, I know I'm born again. But if these folks are moving in an area I don't know about, I'd like to know about it. Because I did read over in Acts that it said not many days hence that the Holy Spirit would baptize them. They'd be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And of course, I've been taught it had already happened and everything else, but I didn't see that much difference. When that bunch over in Acts got hit with that, they, they changed, didn't they? And I thought, well, I'm changed, but not that much. And if there's more of it, I won't know about it. Well, I went to a lot of meetings. I heard Oral Roberts when he first started preaching. I heard Jack Cole. I went, I traveled across the country. I heard a lot of the people that were on the trail. But you know something? I went to churches. But I saw so much false doctrine being taught that I drew back and I said, uh, uh, how can this be right if there's so much here that's completely crossways with the scripture? And so for years I went along and didn't find this. Then I went to Baptist schools and I went to the Dallas Seminary and you talk about heavy inoculation, but I got it. I knew that this was not really for today. It had happened to some people back there, of course. It was obvious. It's in the scriptures. You don't deny what's in the scriptures. But it didn't happen now because it wasn't necessary. It wasn't this. It wasn't that. And then after we got into casting out demons, you must have you aware of how the Lord literally showed me into it. Now, this Baptist preacher has heel marks skidding all the way up to tongues. Ugh. I wasn't I wasn't ready for that. I didn't think. But God was ready. And he was speaking to me. And when he did, it took about, after somebody prayed for me, it took about 30 days for the theological fences to fall. And those theological fences had been built so strong and powerful in my mind against this thing, when they fell, then, the, then this thing took effect. And I began to be able to speak in other tongues. And other things, marvelous things began to happen. Now, I want you to know, I was saved and I preached and saw hundreds of people saved and blessed and into the Word and a whole bunch of other real good things. I even saw some people healed. I'd seen people freed from demons. And then this thing came. And it gave an added dimension. And the next thing you know, our entire little church began to hum and bubble with new vitality. As one by one they came to me and said, I heard you had a strange experience. I said, yes. They said, I want that too. As I laid hands on them and prayed, they too received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, a beautiful, precious thing. And you know, I was so inoculated that for, for weeks, even months, I could not bring myself to call it the baptism in the Holy Spirit. I called it, oh, I don't know, I called it a heavenly language. I called it this and I called it that. And I had it and other people, my, all the people in my church had it. And I couldn't bring myself to call it the baptism in the Holy Spirit because I knew that wasn't right. of was wrong terminology. Then I bumped right straight into it in Acts one day where Jesus said, Not many days hence you'll be baptized in the Holy Spirit. I said, Excuse me, Lord, if that's what you call it, that's what I'll call it. And I haven't had any problems with it since. 
But I'm just simply saying these people had received salvation, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. They had seen many signs and wonders in this Galatian church as Paul established it. And he said, I want to know, Galatians, did you receive this by working at the law? By doing good things, is this what made God do things for you? There's, a, there's an era in the land, and it's bitten a lot of people, that if we do certain good things, then God is going to have to do certain good things we want him to do. In other words, we can put God in a position where he is forced to do something. You know, I've never known a God being forced to do anything. I believe that God teaches us to get into the Word and find out where God is flowing and how the Spirit is leading and get into that, that flow to move along with what God is doing. Once we're in that flow of what the Spirit of God is doing in the church, then God will begin to do things with us and speak to us and He will bring forth gifts and everything else. Our business is not to try to figure out how to tell God what to do. Did you ever instruct God? I think all of us have, you know. Now, Lord, I want you to get a hold of so-and-so over there. I know you're not aware of it, but he is really off. And I've become aware of it, and it's just really bothering me. Well, you know, let's stop and think. God's known about that for a long time, before we ever got aware of it. While we were all kicking up our heels, uh, picking tulips in the devil's field, God was concerned about this area. And just because we've suddenly become knowledgeable about it doesn't mean that it's just suddenly come to God's attention. Is it right to pray for people? Sure. But don't pray as if you're informing God. Hey, God, guess what? You know, I've, you probably overlooked this, but look at here. What's going on here? No, we can go to the Lord and say, Lord, I know you're more concerned about my loved ones and my friends than I. And I've been negligent, but I've become aware. And Father, in Jesus' name, I want to throw what weapons you've given me alongside to draw them to Christ, to draw my loved ones and friends back from the ways of sin. I want to throw my own weapons, whatever spiritual weapons I have, in my own life to pull myself back. I want you to pull me back to where I belong. And he said, Galatians, did you begin with the Spirit or the works of the Lord? How did, you, how did you get started in this? Did you just hear about it by faith? And by faith you reached out and received these marvelous things, salvation, baptism in the Holy Spirit, healing, deliverance. All of these things you had to believe and then God moved. He said, now are you suddenly changed over and suddenly you're going to bring everything to pass by doing gracious, wonderful things. Are you so foolish? Verse 3. Having begun in the Spirit, he said, you were moving so well. You were doing so great. You were moving in faith and believing God, and, and you were looking to him for leadership. Now suddenly, you've got your checklist out, and you're worried about a checklist. Now let me, uh, let me uh, underscore something here. When you and I begin to flow with the Lord, our lives will change. But they won't change because we're trying to impress God. They'll, they'll change because... We fall in love with him and he knocks the shine off of the devil and all his, his little dangles. And we begin to think, well, what God's got is better than that and I sure don't want to fool with that anymore. And our hearts will begin to ache with the same pain that God feels about some of these things that are in our lives. And we begin to ask the Lord for help and strength to get loose from them. That's how it works. Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? He said, do you actually think that that beautiful work that was begun in you as a group of believers and where you rolled forward and you moved, you prayed in faith, you praised the Lord, you worshiped, you, you, uh, you were saved, you were baptized in the Holy Spirit, you experienced healings, deliverances, you saw all kinds of miracles worked in Jesus' name by the power of the Spirit of God. He said, after all that, do you mean you're going to make perfect what God is doing in the flesh? You think that some fleshly thing is going to come up and make perfect the work of God? He said, have you suffered so many things in vain? Remember, when you start in the faith walk, in the grace walk, you get, you know, boy, you began to catch it. The devil hates grace. He hates faith. He loves works. 
because when he gets into the he gets you into the works pond, he will work you to death doing good things that don't amount to hill of beans. You say, well, wait a minute. I thought Christians were supposed to do things. They are. But you have to go back and get your motivations right. We work because we have been saved, not because we are trying to be or trying to impress God. We have to do the things we're doing out of a love for him and gratitude for what he's done. And we're not trying to pay him off. We're just so excited about what he's done that we say, Lord, what can I, uh, you know, how can I, you use me? And usually when you start out, you say, the Lord used me? Who, me? Oh, not me. He, he might use her. She's talented. Oh, she's, you know, she, she can do this. She can, she can sing. She can get up and talk. She, you know, she can talk to people. And not me. I'm shy and withdrawn. And I don't know much. And they know, and not, not, well, maybe use him or not me. Well, you know, he can do this and he can do that. And he has knowledge. He has all this. You mean you want to use me? Yeah. You see, when we move into the floor where God is moving in his body, he begins to use us. And the motivation has to be because we love Jesus. The motivation is all important. And, of course, you can't have right motivation unless you love. If you just are going through the motions trying to impress yourself or impress God or somebody else, it won't work. But if from your heart you love somebody... You're concerned because they're bound. You're concerned because they're in trouble. You're concerned because they have needs. And if because of love, you reach out to them and really concern and compassion. If you reach out to them in prayer, if you reach out to them physically, if you reach out to them materially, however God shows you to reach, that's when the blessing comes. Because then you become, you become the instrument of God moving out to bless somebody. But it's not because you or I are so righteous. It's because we have fallen in love with Jesus. It all goes back to him. And so often when people start out this way, then they end up saying, well, if I do X number of good deeds, you know, then I got, brown, I got points with the Lord up there, you know. Did you check that off, Lord? Did you notice I witnessed again. I said, don't you want to trust Jesus? You don't? Well, go to hell. That's where you're going. Did you know some people are actually that blunt? And they get their little book and they check it out. Well, I did my best. That's not doing your best. Hmm? You'd be better off not to witness to so many, but to spend time in prayer and ask the Father to lead you to the ones who are ready. If you witness to 20 in a day and nobody is really moved by God, how much better it would be to witness to two who are actually God has prepared and they either ask Jesus in their heart or you bring them along under God's leadership. You lead them to a place so you can leave them and God will send in another worker who will bring them across. You say, well, no, I want to do it. Well, now, wait a minute. Haven't you ever read that some plant, some water, and some harvest you say, well, I want to be the harvester. Who wants to plant? How no can you get? You don't get to see nothing. No, because it takes faith to plant, doesn't it? I don't want to be sprinkling all the time. I want to be there when you bring, the, bring home the bacon. I want to be there when it, <laughs> uh, chalk it up. I'll lend another one to the Lord. You may have very little credit as far as God's concerned. The groundwork was done by the planting and watering. Some old grandmother in the closet's gone to be with Jesus. Prayed for that wayward boy long before you knew he existed. She wept and cried in the closet and finally went home to heaven without seeing him saved. And you just happened to be on the way and God, by a series of things, had brought him around and you happened to be there when the harvest came in. That's why it's not wise to get all charged up on, I led 500 people to the Lord last year. Well, that's all right, but don't get all high on it. The main work may have been done by somebody you never heard of. Chances are it was. We're all in a team, don't you see? There are too many people trying to be all the whole thing. They want to be the whole show. Did you ever see a football team play? 
I want branches sinners, did you? Yeah, you've seen it, haven't you? Does just one fellow grab the ball and run with it and the other team stand on the side and said, well, shoot, if I can't carry the ball, I'm not going to play. Let him carry the ball. He's got it. What's going to happen to the ball carrier? Well, he's going to be slaughtered. And when one of the guys goes across, he has the ball and he gets, well, supposing the ball is passed or kicked and, to somebody and the guy that's aimed for it doesn't get it. But another teammate grabs it and he starts running with it. The one that was supposed to get it said, well, hmm, you got in my way. I was supposed to do that. And when the guy runs across the line, all the other team members says, well, I hope you're satisfied. You're some kind of glory grabber. Well, you know that's not the way it works. When that ball goes across the line, that team doesn't care who's carrying the ball. Even the fellow sitting on the benches and not even out there running. They go wild, don't they? You ever see them? They say churches are strange. You ought to watch one of these sporting events. They actually go nuts. They jump up and down and holler and scream and hug one another and throw one another up in the air. It looks like there's a battle going on out there among the winners. They get so excited. Why? Because their team scored. Not because that one person did. Same thing with ball games. See? And we forget so often that moving in the Lord's army is a team effort. We need to be happy to have a part in what's going on. Amen? We can rejoice because we get to have a part of it. And everybody gets to rejoice when our team wins, right? When a demon leaves screaming, all our people say, Oh, there goes another one. Praise the Lord. I didn't throw him out, but one of my brothers and sisters over got him treated. Praise the Lord, huh? When somebody gets saved, everybody's happy. They don't stand around and pout and say, Well, I'm going to get one too. <laughs> what a ridiculous attitude, you know. This is a team effort. The Holy Spirit is flowing. Brothers and sisters working together to smash the works of darkness. The Galatians had tried to switch over. They had suffered so many things for standing for the right. And he said, have you suffered so many things in vain? If it is in vain, if it's in vain to be in grace and, and to be going by the grace principles. He said, and you've suffered all these things for nothing. You took all this abuse. You left your works religions. You left off serving false gods and idols where you worked your way into good works and all this kind of stuff. You left your works religions and you came to Jesus and threw it all overboard and said it's grace and praise God for grace. The marvelous grace of Jesus. And then your families turned on you and your friends turned on you and you suffered all kinds of reproach and, you, and they came at you at work and everything else and you suffered all these things and he said... And you didn't really have to because if you're just going to do another works religion, you, there's no need for any of it. So everybody loves the works religion. That's in the world. He therefore that ministers to you the Spirit, works miracles among you, doeth he yet by the works of the law, by the hearing of faith. He said, even these boys that are strapping you so tight to the law, said if they move in the spirit and work miracles in Jesus name are they doing that by the law did they read your little set of rules and regulations is that what makes the miracles happen or is it done by faith and speaking in the name of Jesus Christ remember even some of these teachers carrying the wrong things can produce some goods if they know enough to move in the name of Jesus they'll soon phase that out one thing about a works religion, when you get over in it, you soon phase out. Pretty soon you're not sure of your salvation anymore. And pretty soon, then you have to come up with some perfection scheme so that you can be perfect and you don't have to be afraid. And so you look down on the other ordinary people who don't have all your glorious revelations. And you move out of the ordinary into the theological tower of perfection. And you work out some little system whereby you don't have to be afraid, but the other people do. And these are two things that will happen when you get on this trail. You will sooner or later lose your sureness of the sufficiency of the blood of Jesus and the grace of God 
to hold you in place, and then you will move from there. You will move into perfectionism, or you're walking on a razor blade. What a comfortable walk, huh? Ooh, I better watch out if I step just a teeny bit off, I'll be gone. And, you know, you hear people threatening in Congress, if you don't walk this way, you're going to plunge into darkness. Come on. Whatever happened to grace? The Galatians that start out, now then they're fascinated, they're concentrating on walking on that razor blade to be sure they get everything right. Get my hair parted on the right side. Trim my whiskers a certain way. Get my coat length, sleeves a certain length. All kinds of rules and regulations to keep me straight and pure and holy. I'm not making fun of holiness, but the false, phony stuff is a bunch of baloney. And it makes you look ridiculous. Some people today think they're more holy because they dress in black robes that came out in the medieval times and wear little white hoods around their face. Makes them look like little penguins walking around. I mean, they actually think this makes them holy. They really do. They're, they're honest about it. They really believe this. And you know, some of us get almost as foolish with some of our things. We think that we're going to become holy by some of these things. Now there are things we ought to quit. You find them spelled out in the Bible. There are things we ought to do. But God never threatens to send you to hell if you do or you don't. He always comes and says, I love you. Now you know, if he said, I'll send you to hell, you might just get mean and say, go ahead. I don't care. But if he comes at you and said, I love you, That'll knock the daylights out of the stubbornest man, the most rebellious person. I don't care who it is. We got a sign over that entry door out there. It says, Jesus didn't say, I love you if. He doesn't say, I love you if. He just says, I love you. And that's a little old motto, but it has a lot of meaning to it. Jesus doesn't love us if, he just loves us. And I don't understand that. But there's nothing can make me feel more like crawling in a crack than for God to come at me and say, Son, why do you have this ugly attitude? Why have you done this or not that? I said, I suppose you're mad at me. No, he said, I love you. Ew. That's bad. You know, that's, that's bad news. You don't want to hear that. You know you're a stinker. You know you've got blocks in your life. You know you've been stubborn against the Lord. And then he comes up, instead of jumping all over you and fussing at you, he just said, I just thought I'd like to tell you how much I love you again. Ooh. Did you ever melt in your closet? Give before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm sorry. Ooh. I am undoubtedly the most ungrateful creature you've ever saved. I don't know why you'd want to save me. And then it all starts coming out and unraveling, doesn't it? Hmm? And God said, I don't require all this. Just that you be recognized or you've slipped and fallen. Now let's, let's go back and, and fix it up. He's the God of beginning again. Oh, my, my, my. I've never in all these years, well, let's see, what am I about? In the 38, 39th year of pastoring churches. The thing that still amazes me is how gracious he is with us, how patient, how loving, how kind. Oh, he puts us to shame all the time, doesn't he? And always he loves us, but he has a firmness about it. And don't kid yourself, he doesn't have a razor strap. Now, you may not want to know what a razor strap is for. It's a sharp razors. But when I was a kid growing up, it sharpened more than razors. It's a thick leather strap, and woo, does it burn when applied low and hard across somebody's stubborn seat. I was, uh, my dad uh, was a great believer in the biblical principles, including spare the rod and spoil the child. And he knew how to apply that liberally, and I want you to know something. It headed me off from a lot of things. All of us have demons, you know, that drive us to do things. And demons would, of course, come at me like they do you and everybody else and say, 
come on and do this. I said, no, uh, I'm not supposed to do that. No, it won't make any difference. Nobody will ever know. But you know, there were times when I leaned that way and the thought of that strap behind the door and the uncanny way that my dad always found out, no matter how careful it was hidden, no matter how nonchalantly I came in, <whistles> son, yes, sir. Well, no, yeah, no in my house. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. And I don't know till this day how it happened, but he had a way of finding these things out. And judgment was as sure as the rising of the morning sun. I mean, there was absolutely no escape. There were times when there was a delay. Maybe we had company. And my dad didn't like to hang family matters in front of the company if, unless it was absolutely necessary. And there were times when I was doing something and my dad walked up and said, I told you not to do that, son. Yes, sir. And he had blue eyes. And at those times, they had a steely quality that just gave them a, a sort of like piercing quality that went right through me. And I thought, oh, because you, you see, if he told me not to do something and I did it, judgment was very near. But we had company, you see. So he went on and he talked and he laughed. And I thought, maybe he's forgotten. Wouldn't that be great? You know, it's always the first time. And I'd kind of get relaxed and happy, you know. And very good, of course. Very good. Oh, yes. I mean, boy, I told the mark. No more. I didn't want to remind him that there had been a misstep back there, you see. And maybe he would forget. Maybe he'd forget all about it. But, oh, it didn't work. As soon as the company was gone, goodbye, we're glad to see you. Happy days. I was getting ready to go to bed. I usually got very sleepy at times like that. Or now I hated going to bed. But in times like that, it was time to go to bed. Oh, I was so sleepy. And I would be quietly trying to very uh, quietly and unobtrusively uh, get off to bed. Might even remark... Well, I should have sleepy. I think I'll just go to bed. My dad would say, I'd like to see you in the bathroom, son. My blood turned to ice. Or behind that bathroom door, there was a strap that sharpened more than razors. It sharpened my apprehension of right and wrong. It sharpened my awareness. And he never, he never threatened and didn't do it either. I mean, he didn't say, I'll whip you if you do that. And then I did it again. And he said, I told you I'd whip you if you did that. Now you better cut out. Don't you do that again. Well, any kid will take advantage of that. With my dad, once was deadly. That was all that was necessary. And you know, we might as well feel, deal this. We're dealing with a God who loves us. Now, I used to think my dad didn't like me much. I mean, anybody hurt a kid like that, that hurt. But it sure didn't make me resist the demons, I'll tell you that. No way am I giving in to that. Listen, <laughs> yeah, it'd be fun to do that, but it ain't fun what comes after. And my dad will see that it comes after. And I knew that. And it kept me out of a lot of trouble that I could have been in when I was younger. Parents, don't threaten your children. Do it. Tell them once, maybe even tell them twice. Don't yell at them, get a board and let them know that you mean business. Then you won't have to yell as much. Save your voice. You'll always be hoarse from hollering. You won't be frustrated either. They'll soon learn. Well, he said, 
it's by the hearing of faith these things come. They just don't mix works and faith. They just don't, they don't mix at all. They're not the same. It's like oil and water. They won't mix. You're either going to have to go works or faith. You're going to have to go grace or works. If it's by grace, it's no longer works. If it's by works, it's no longer grace. You know that we can get a fresh look at the grace of Jesus. The law came by Moses, the scripture says. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. My, I'm so glad, aren't you? How I thank God to live in an era, a time when God's grace is poured out so freely, so richly, until you wonder how could God keep on loving us. imperfect creatures and yet he said I'm going to tear down strongholds I'm going to use you as my army I'm going to give you power over all the power of the enemy Lord can you trust people like us with power well he says I'll work on you a little bit as we go God has a, a marvelous on the job training program I mean, he works on you and as you move in his army and begin to learn how to work for him. One of the most interesting things I've ever found is the fact that how God will deal with all of us graciously and he will use us to minister to the limit that we are able to minister. Everybody doesn't minister to the same length or depth or so forth. doesn't matter. That's why it's so important to have a body ministry. Because where one believer's ministry runs out, and this is as far as they can go. This is as much as they know. This is all they can handle. They can turn to some other believer and say, Hey, I'm stalled here. I need some more help. And then another believer or two come in and reinforce. And it's again, I remind you, it's a team effort. It's not a one-man show. It's not a Hollywood Star Trek thing. It's rather our team is in battle with the enemy. We want to see the P ourselves and the other people set free. We want to learn how to walk with Jesus and how to love each other. How to love each other is the hardest thing of all. You know, it's a lot easier to love the heathen over in Africa that you never do see than somebody you sit by in church. That heathen doesn't bother you. That other person might. Hmm? Some of you wives are looking up at your husband like this. But God has ordained that we move together in a group and then we have certain blessings we get by association with each other and blessings we receive together. And then we have blessings God gives to us separately and privately and in a group. And we need all those blessings. None of us can get along with just one half of it. God has ordained that the believers flow together and move together and be a help to each other. I thank God for that, don't you? Praise the Lord. If you're here this night and you don't know the Lord Jesus, there could be a man, a woman, a boy, a girl, a young person. You're a little bit fuzzy on your relationship with Jesus Christ. It's possible. This world's full of deception, delusion, flying all over the place, going everywhere. And you can get spun out a lot of times. And you begin to wonder, well, really, am I really saved? Do I really know? All right. Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in. I'll tell you how you can head off those doubts and fears. This was taught to me when I was a baby Christian many years ago over in China in the service. I had a prayer partner boy from Tennessee, and he, he taught me this. He said, when the devil comes and tries to shake you on your salvation, the way to head him off at the pass is not to fight with him, but just say, okay, you say I'm lost. You're trying to frighten me. If I'm lost, I know the plan of salvation. Here it is. It says to ask Jesus to come in your heart. Lord Jesus, if I've never really asked you in my heart before, I'm asking you here and now, come in my heart and save me. Now, you know, it wasn't too long after I did that a few times, the devil cut that out. Because every time I did that, the Lord Jesus just said, My son, son I, you're already saved. What are you, what are you concerned about? It? I've already come in your heart. And it just made my salvation more real and precious. The only thing you, people get upset if you say, why don't you just say, Lord Jesus, if I've never really asked you in my heart before I'm asking you here now, come into my heart. The only reason somebody get upset about that is if they're not really sure. Doesn't bother me. Shouldn't bother you. 
And if you'll do that with the devil several times, when he starts working on your mind, trying to spin you out and make you think this and think that, if you'll start doing that on him, you'll find out pretty soon he'll, he'll decide to go a different route and his attack on you. He will not attack there. That's how you can settle it tonight. And if it doesn't settle the doubts and the fears and the confusion that you may have concerning your relationship with Jesus, by all means, come forward and just tell one of the workers up here, I need to talk to somebody about salvation. Someone will sit down with the Word of God, go over God's plan of salvation carefully with you, and see if you are resting firmly on what Jesus said you needed to do to be saved. If you are, you can stop doubting, stop being confused, start rejoicing. That's good, isn't it? If you happen to have been on the wrong trail, if you got off in one of these works religion, got starched and iron, never washed in the blood, then that worker can show you how to get into the right plan of salvation tonight. And you still win. Amen? That's not your problem, but you're driven, you're harassed, tormented. And this is producing compulsive behavior, which is slowing down, stopping, reversing your spiritual growth and progress. This is how demons operate in lives. They operate in the soul, the mind, will, and emotions, and the body. The spirit is sealed by the Holy Spirit, but the rest of the areas are the places they're attacking. And if you have problems like this that you have not been able to get a handle on, by all means come seek help and deliver us. Jesus said, These signs shall follow them that believe in my name, so they cast out devils. That's his remedy for demonic problems. Another sign that follows believers, they shall speak with new tongues. We don't hesitate to offer, uh, encourage people to seek this gift. It's a gift from the Lord. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is a gift. You say, well, I was taught against it. I was too. You say, I don't know much about it. I didn't either. But someone here could explain it to you. And if it's a gift from the Lord. He never gave a gift that wasn't right. And he never did revoke this. It's as valid as evangelism. It's as valid as deliverance. It's as valid as healing. You've got to throw the whole thing out if you're going to throw that out. They shall speak with new tongues. It's one of the signs that follows believers. And they shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. There are people here who believe that Jesus heals and would pray with you concerning physical needs. Let's stand saying something about that name. As we do, if you have a need, we encourage you to come and seek help in prayer.